Thank you for your gifts of conscience and intelligence. We ask you, Lord, to form each of our consciences in a way that is consistent with your precepts and the precepts of your church so we can become every day a better version of ourselves. Give us, Lord, the strength to live as your examples in this messed up world. Give us the resolve to stand up for your name in everything we pursue and conquer. To proclaim proudly the fact that we are Catholic Christians. Count on us, Lord to make this world better each day by the example we give. And this we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was telling in my um, um, group of, uh, of uh, eating and uh, coffee drinking uh, crowd over there uh, that uh, we had a little problem last week, uh, a little miscommunication between Father Mo and I. And um, When I came in, I had already prepared the presentation for today, which was supposed to be the first commandment. And uh, as he started presenting, he said, today we're going to talk about the first commandment. I said, oh, you know what? And I had to quickly go home and uh, prepare the presentation that he was supposed to do <laughs> for this week. So we did a little switching, and actually there's no uh, really implications because um, it, you know, it, it, it's pretty switchable, so it, it's not a problem. But, uh, but I got quite a surprise, and, uh, and, and I never told him because um, it, it, was, it was a mixed – of, of chapters and so on and so forth, so, um, and he did a great job, so no problem. Okay, today we're going to talk about the social teaching of the church, um, and it's a tough subject, and uh, we're going to talk about some things that uh, uh, are very relevant, some things that you know very well, and some things that um, may even shock you. Uh, but we're going to cover it all. And um, first, I'd like to start with uh, some facts. Um, the first fact is that Jesus' teaching regarding one's relationship with neighbors is the model uh, for the social teaching of the church. That's the key. The true lo love of neighbor is based on justice. And like somebody reminded me, there is no social justice, there's just justice. The true love of neighbor is based on justice. We must render to each person his due or her due. There is a prime difference, really a third fact. There is a very, very prime difference between Christianity and any other faith. 
and that is that Christian revelation is very, very special because of God's relationship to humanity. Our God is a ruler, yes, but he is much more than a ruler. He is a father for his children. He is an intimate God. He is a friend. And you won't find that in any other religion. Not in Islam, not in Hinduism, not in Buddhism. The church proposes principles and guidelines for action based on the Gospels, on the Gospels of Jesus Christ, to solve our social problems. It's not based on, you know, just somebody picking something. It is the message from the Gospel. It's the action based on the message from the Gospel. For example, I don't know if you know but the church was the first to defend the rights of workers to organize. And you'll see other things in here that again, we forget when people think of the church as something high and mighty and very rich and just not really caring about people. Those who practice social justice live by one model, and that is one for all and all for one. And that motto came from a Catholic priest, Father Heinrich Piesch, a Jesuit. The bottom line is that success in resolving social problems is only possible when faith is combined with the proper use of human freedom. And that's what we tend to forget. Okay. Now, let's talk about the heart of the social arena, the family. The catechism defines family as the community in which one can learn moral values, begin to honor God, and make good use of freedom. That's the catechism. The family is also the first school of social justice. The family should be inspired by the gospel teachings. We tend to forget that. But that should be the basis of the family. The family must be a place for piety. This is where we establish a sense of duty towards family, duty towards church, and duty towards country. Of course, the family has rules and obligations and rewards, and we all know that. However, the hierarchical body of the family is meant to have a head, the father, and a heart, the mother. We tend to forget that too. Both parents are equal in dignity, but with different functions. Families will be joyful if parents teach each child to serve the others and share their burdens. Most of you know that uh, um, um, the Mosiers and the Poza have a, a combined family in Virginia. 
um, David and Vanessa Mosier, uh, Vanessa being our daughter, and uh, um, we visit probably once every couple of months. And it's a joy, of course, after five days and six kids, uh, it's time to come home. Okay, so don't, 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 you know, I'm not gonna paint a, you know, <laughs> idyllic, yeah, idyllic picture, but, but you know, it, it, it always um, amazes me, the joy that I feel when I go to visit and it's not a joy because she's my daughter and I have six grandchildren and, and Dave has always been great to us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, yeah, that's, the, that's part of the joy and happiness to see them. But the real joy comes to see the behavior of those kids. The way that they're growing and in some cases have grown how they take care of each other, how they love each other, how they look for the blessings of the mom and dad at bedtime. I took my granddaughter, um, Hope, to the father-daughter dance uh, because that's what she wanted as a Christmas present. And when we got home, the first thing and the only thing she wanted to do was to call her daddy and ask for a blessing before she went to bed. That is what joy is about. I mean, I've been at the top at work and so on and so forth. Let me tell you, there is nothing that replaces seeing that. And it's because those kids have been taught to take care of themselves, to take care of their brothers and sisters, and to love. Anyway, I could keep on. Um, Christian charity must be learned in the family. It is the family that's the foundation of social justice. Parents also have an obligation to avoid scandalizing their children by word or by conduct, by action. And I'm not going to go into that. You all know that. We've all suffered at one point or another of something that we've said, something that we've done, and it comes back to bite us. The goodness of the family unit determines ultimately where the world is headed. And the progressive disintegration of the family today does not bode well for the future of our world. Now let's move from the family to the obligations of national governments. And how that applies to social justice. First, it must be established that uh, communities are made up of persons who have rights. And those rights have to be guaranteed by the government. Communities are always organized around a common good. Now we sort of lose the definition of common good, but I'll tell you a bit about common good. The common good has three components that are very basic. The one is a respect for all persons' natural freedom. The second one is accessibility to work, food, clothing, health, education, 
and other essential needs. Whether you take care of those or not, that's a, your problem, but has to be accessible. And the third is peace and stability of a just order. Peace and stability. The common good must be founded on truth, built up in justice, animated by love, and directed toward progress of persons both materially and spiritually. The political community from local to state to national governments has the duty to honor the family, the basic unit, assist it and ensure the freedom to profess one's faith, the right to private property, free enterprise, to obtain work and housing, and ensure the protection of security and health, which also includes the right to medical care. Finally, and in a separate tone, as a developed nation, we must always avoid exploitation of poorer nations. Now to the tough subject. Since we're talking about governments and government's responsibilities, I thought we ought to talk about a particular subject. That's the guarantee of religious freedom. We should, we ought to worship God. Society must recognize our right to do so as well as facilitate and defend the exercise of that right. This has to be treated as a fundamental right. Vatican II clearly proclaims that every human person has a right to religious freedom, not only in this nation, but everywhere. Nobody, but nobody, is to be forced to act against his convictions. I say that again, nobody. In addition, civil authority has no power to limit exercise of the right to worship God in private, period. Vatican II says, to deny man the free exercise of religion in society is to do injustice to the human person and to the order established by God for men. That's pretty clear. So the bottom line is the state has no right to dictate anything to you that infringes upon your religious freedom. Okay, let's go to a different topic, and that is in the social structure, the role of women, which again is a big topic and still is. It has been, it still is. God created first man and woman in his likeness. They each have a special dignity. Now, original sin placed women in an inferior role to men when God said, after the original sin, man will rule over you. And because of that, many problems and injustices have arisen and have been suffered by women from unjust situations in marriage and elsewhere in society. 
John Paul II wrote Dignity of Women, where he points out that the redeeming actions of Christ were partly dire directed to recognition of the dignity and vocation of women. The whole discourse of Christ's response to the question regarding the question asked by the Pharisees regarding whether divorce was permissible indicated men may no longer dominate women. And I want you to listen to this because, again, it's important. This is from Matthew chapter 19. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus and said to test him, may a man divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever? He replied, have you not read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And he declared, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become as one. Thus they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, let no man separate what God has joined. They said to him, then why did Moses command divorce and the promulgation of a divorce decree? And Jesus answered, because of your stubbornness, Moses let you divorce your wives. But at the beginning, it was not that way. I now say to you, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That statement itself, at that time, raised the stature of women. They were no longer property. Nothing in Jesus' actions directed toward women condones unjust discrimination. In fact, remember the episode in the Gospel where men are getting together to stone a woman caught in adultery. And Jesus says to them, let the man among you who has no sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Of course, they all left. There was nobody there with no sin. Like there's nobody here with no sin. What he did there was to tell her that she was saved, but go sin no more. Now, how are we supposed to treat the world God has given us as well as its resources? We get all sorts of political stuff at us, thrown at us. The Catechism tells us that the goods of creation are, are destined for the whole human race. The goods of creation are destined for the whole human race. Personal wealth must not be made an excuse to purchase and consume whatever one's heart desires. It is incumbent upon each one of us to remember that the wealth we have, whether it's monetary or anything else, has been given to us as a gift from God. And we have to remember to properly use it as he asks us to do. We also have an obligation to use 
to use the goods of this world as God intended. We must protect the goods of the earth through responsible regulations in financially responsible way. In other words, we can't just use up and mangle mangle the resources in the world, the resources that God has given us. It requires a religious respect for the integrity of creation. That said, God also gave us the rule of the world. We are, as human beings, men and women, the rulers of the world. Now let's take a look now at our responsibilities towards the poor. Because Christ clearly told us to love the poor. Love for the poor is incompatible with the attitude that a person has earned right to spend wealth as he chooses. That makes us again masters, and we are not. We have one master. Wealth is God's gift, and he demands we share that gift willingly. That's a key word, willingly with those less fortunate. Not by being told we have to, but by choosing to do so because we love. And for that, we will be judged. Jesus lived a life of poverty to indicate concern for the poor. And the church reaches, reaches out to the poor so that a good example might lead them to Christ's message of salvation. The church, for example, was the first to create hospitals, okay? hospitals for the poor. The first one to create food kitchens for the poor. We tend to forget that. We ought to be very proud of that. That's what the Catholic Church has done and is doing for society in general, not just for Catholics. Everyone should aid the poor to the extent reasonable and possible after taking care of personal needs. And the key word there is needs, not wants, <clears throat> not likes, needs. And now there's a reading that I know you will remember, but it's, well, let me, let me get to that later. He, he and uh, Jesus in, in the uh, uh, Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 says, Give to him who begs from you. Do not refuse him who would borrow from you. And the opportunities also exist to aid the poor in areas of cultural and religious poverty. That's why we have catechists to teach those that are, quote, in religious poverty. Children are in religious poverty because they're coming up, growing, and not knowing their faith. The same is true for adults in the RCIA program. So it's not just material, it's spiritual. As we're talking about the poor, 
This is something that you were taught a long time ago, probably. But we ought to bring this back. The works of mercy. Following the gospel, we are called to provide comfort to those materially and spiritually poor, as we have just talked about, with the spiritual works of mercy and the corporal works of mercy. The spiritual works of mercy, counseling the doubtful, instructing the ignorant, admonishing sinners, instructing the ignorant, that's where catechists come in, comforting the afflicted, forgiving the offenses of others on us, bearing wrongs patiently, and providing for the living and the dead, or praying for the living and the dead. In the corporal side, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, visiting the sick. I've told you the story um, of something that, as a family, my wife and I, Karen and I, did um, when the kids were little, uh, nine, six, and three at the time. And um, we, every Sunday for a year, uh, for two hours, Sunday afternoon, we would take him to visit um, old folks' homes. Uh, in some cases, they were very sick. In some cases, they were just plain old, like me. Um, but, you know, what I'm amazed about is that at the time, I thought, we thought, this was probably a good idea. It would teach us all something. We weren't exactly sure what that would be, but it would teach us something. When we get together as a family now, it's amazing how the stories come back from these kids, stories that I even forgot, of when they visited the old folks in the homes and what they learned. Now, at the time, the young one, Vanessa, was the only one that appreciated the visits. The nine and the six-year-old, eh. But it's amazing, again, how much they remembered in those situations and how much they learned. Visiting the imprisoned. Bob McKenna is not here this morning with us, but Bob does that. Visiting prisoners. Bearing wrongs, I'm sorry, burying the dead and sheltering the homeless. Doing nothing puts you in the same category as the rich young man in the gospel. And you probably all know that. The rich young man said, oh, I, I do all these commandments. What else do I do? And the Lord said, go sell everything you have and then come follow me. And that was too hard for him. A very sad story. But that is a key story for the world of today, for so many men and women. Sad stories like that. Okay. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. Doing nothing puts us in the class of the rich young man. Okay. Lastly, how do we relate to people that are different? The U.S. College of Bishops tells us that society has the obligation to take positive steps to overcome any, any legacy of injustice. The race problem or discrimination, whether real or perceived, has persisted in the U.S. for a long time. And it comes at different times in different colors, quote unquote. It affects blacks, Hispanics, Asians, Jews, 
Native Americans, and especially today, Catholics. Okay? Look around. If you don't think you're discriminated against today, think again for being Catholic and standing up for your faith. Discrimination based on sex, race, ethnicity, religion, or age is a great injustice and an affront to human dignity. The church has repeatedly called for end of any discrimination even during times when it was not politically correct. Cardinal George, the Archbishop of Chicago at the time, wrote, dwell in my love, and he tells us that racism contradicts God's will for our salvation. We cannot claim to love God without loving every type of neighbor. And finally, I just wanted to uh, go through um, some of the key points of the social teaching of the church. Number one, the true validity of the love of God is found in love of neighbor. You cannot say that you love God, but you don't care about your neighbor, your friend, or even your enemies. It's just not compatible. The unity between the love of God and the love of neighbor is attested to by Christ's own words and his life. Social justice is directed at enabling every person in society to become better version of themselves. And this is key. It is directed towards the individuals working as a team. Okay, so social justice, in the Christian sense, is directed at individuals working as a team. It is not in any way to accomplish a perfect society. That is not what it means. Every Christian is obligated to work for solidarity among all members of society. Social justice cannot exclude any person or group from its reach. And lastly, but very importantly, a Christian must be vigilant in protection of his faith and his religious freedom. We must always stand for the truth. Let's look at three questions that I'd like you to take a look at uh, in the small groups. And by the way, they're on the cards as you walk out on the, the table so you can take them with you um, so that you know what the questions are. First one is, what do you think distinguishes Christian revelation from all other faiths? We talked about that, but I'd like to know what you think. What makes our God different than, quote, the other versions of God? How do you practice the love of God and neighbor in your everyday life? That's key. And I'm asking you to give examples because I want you to recollect. Think about how you apply it every day. This is not a case of Sunday is a day that I worry about my neighbor, about my God. You have to do that 24-7. Thirdly, do you feel your faith is under attack today? And if you do, what can you do to stand for your Christian faith? It's a very tough question, very tough to deal with, but it's absolutely necessary today. And next week, we're going to talk about the Second Commandment, and hopefully the communication will be right. Thank you very much, and God bless. 
Oh, son of 